Um, hi folks, it's day 70 today, so um, after today there's only 20 days left, so it feels kind of like I'm getting into the home straight here. Um, yeah, I didn't think I'd make 70 days, if I'm being honest. Uh, so, yeah, I feel like I've kind of achieved something there, which is good. Um, today I just want to talk a little bit about something that I've been meaning to talk about over and over and over again, and I haven't really got around to it. And I mentioned in one of my previous videos I was going to talk about it, so I'm going to talk about it now to get out, well not get out of the way, but to kind of get it out there. Uh, because there have been some developments actually concerning this subject, so I feel like I want to talk about it now. So today I want to talk about, um, this is probably going to, some people are going to watch this video and maybe feel a bit weird about it, or uncomfortable, or yeah i think a lot of people can have an opinion about this video so i just want to get that out of the way first this warning almost um so today i'm going to be talking about psychedelics um so psychedelic drugs and i know that there's a great stigma attached to kind of psychedelic medicine um psychedelic drugs um so i'm talking about things like uh, magic mushrooms lsd um, MDMA, ketamine, um, there's like some natural kind of plant based ones, um, ayahuasca is one, um, there's also DMT, um, which is dimethyltryptamine, I think, which is kind of, um, you know, I'm not going to talk about too many. I'm going to focus on um, magic mushrooms today in this video because that's where my interest is kind of aimed at at the moment. But yeah, when you start talking about, you know, drugs, which are essentially, they're legal still at the moment, they're criminalised um, drugs, like, worldwide, they've started becoming decriminalised in certain areas now, so there's places like Holland where they've always kind of been legal, I think, um, certainly magic mushrooms, I don't know about the rest, um, but just recently in America, I think it was Denver, they decriminalised magic mushrooms, um, and they're doing that because uh, there's been evidence that suggests that they're very, very good for treating mental illness. So especially things like depression, anxiety, um, addiction as well. LSD has been kind of, the, they've done studies where it can be really good for alcoholism and things like that. And I know that when I start, if people start talking about, you know, psychedelics, they've been demonized over the years i think um going right back to like the 60s and the 70s um so i think there's quite a narrow kind of so there's just a train whistle just going there if you heard that sorry um i didn't put that in for comedy effect <laughs> it just happened um so yeah when you start talking about psychedelics people I find are quite, I w I'm not going to say narrow-minded, but uneducated is what I would say. Um, and I was one of them, so, you know, I know exactly where people are coming from, because when I first kind of heard about it and I first kind of looked into this, my opinion on psychedelic medicine, and especially magic mushrooms and LSD, were that they were kind of like... Um, a recreational drug that was being abused by lots of people and it was bad and you wanted to stay away from stuff like that but since I've kind of gone to it and I've been doing a lot of research into it and I've spoken to lots and lots of people about it and I've watched lots of like kind of TED talks and lectures and things like that it's really opened my eyes to the to the world that can be kind of opened up to you just through the use of these kind of psychedelic substances. Um, so for people who are uncomfortable about it and think that, you know, people who use these things are bad or, you know, the, the magic mushrooms and LSD are inherently bad and evil and shouldn't be used, I would suggest that maybe just become a little bit more open-minded towards them a little bit more educated. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about psilocybin, which is, it's the active, it's the psychoactive ingredient in magic mushrooms. 
Um, I do have kind of like an uh, interest in all of them really, so LSD and ayahuasca and DMT, but my main kind of focus has been on psilocybin. So since I found out about psilocybin, I've researched it because that's the one that looks most promising in terms of going forward with treatments for depression, anxiety. And it's looking really, really good actually. They, they've been doing quite a lot of um, medical trials and studies at the moment. Um, so Imperial College here in London are doing them and King's College in London and they're doing a lot in the States as well. I know John Hopkins is really pushing kind of research. Um, the unfortunate thing is though, there's not a lot of kind of funding going into it. It's all privately funded research at the moment because nobody wants to touch it, which I can understand because it is a criminal, it is a illegal substance essentially and it hasn't been decriminalized yet. Um, people are allowed to use it for um, medical research purposes, which is why Imperial College and King's College are using it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, no kind of, normally when a drug gets developed, and I know this because I've, uh, I've been involved in kind of medical research a lot in my life, purely from a kind of financial gain point of view. I used to like to test a lot of drugs when I was younger. You know, you get paid like a couple of grand to test some medication for a couple of weeks. And it was easy money, you know, it was really good at the time. And it just, it blew me away how much money goes into, how much money pharmaceutical industries invest in developing new drugs and kind of tweaking existing drugs there's a hell of a lot. There's like a multi-billion dollar industry. And the problem when it comes to psychedelic medicines and uh, chemicals and um, medications is there's not a lot of repeat business. And I'll get into that later on. But so yeah, psilocybin, it, like I said, it's the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And the research is looking really, really good at the moment. I mean, it's still early days. Um, they can't kind of look at the long-term effects because it's been it's too early for that. There's only like in the last maybe five years that research has really kind of started taking off again. And, you know, this is stuff that was happening back in the 40s and 50s, and it's stuff that's been happening for centuries. You know, magic mushrooms have been around for as long as man's been around. And in like a lot of indigenous tribes and, you know, shamans and, you know, the medicine men, they all use these kind of psychedelic substances in their day to day lives when, you know, them and their tribes, you know, things like definitely magic, you know, magic mushrooms and ayahuasca, and peyote and things like that. So this stuff's been around for centuries and it's been used therapeutically for centuries. The problem came around, I think, um, and a lot of promising research was being done in the West, so based on these kind of tribal medicines back in the 40s and 50s. And the problem was, uh, and like that was kind of like around about the time that LSD was discovered as well, completely by accident. Some like chemist discovered LSD, uh, and the company he was actually working for. They were pushing LSD out there to see what kind of applications it could have. They were giving that stuff away to like loads and loads of research people. And it was looking promising back then, you know, that it was really helpful with addiction and kind of uh, tra trauma treatments. And the problem came around, I think, there was a certain period in history, um, and it was kind of around the time of the Vietnam War. Um, where these kind of psychoactive psychedelic substances started to be abused by the public and by researchers. There's a guy called Timothy O'Leary, I think, or Tim O'Leary. He's probably one of the biggest kind of culprits. So he worked for, I can't remember, it was one of the big prestigious universities in America, and he was using, like, he was doing research into kind of psychedelics, especially LSD. And he kind of took it a bit too far. He started kind of giving it away to all his students. And he, you know, he, he took it away from the kind of therapeutic, medicinal, you know, applications that it could have. And he turned it into more of like a lifestyle choice that, you know, we should all 
be doing it. Because the whole point of these psychedelic substances is, you know, they're psychoactive substances, which means they make your brain kind of do things that it doesn't normally do. So it forms a lot of connections and there'd be a lot of neuron activity, you know, neurons firing where they wouldn't normally do that. And lots of kind of, like I say, neural connections that never really happen in the course of your life. And they've discovered over years of doing research that, you know, that kind of experience of your mind, like turning to another level of activity that it's never had before. It's really good in kind of forming this, fostering this feeling inside of, you know, I've, I've read it as being described as like a loss of ego um, and a feeling of connectedness with something greater than yourself which is you know for a lot of people who are depressed it's normally it's very um, you know they're very nihilistic they're very kind of existential crisis you know that kind of thing where they don't think there's any purpose in life that they're just kind of here and then they die and there's no what's the reason why am I here it's kind of and these psychoactive substances they kind of make your brain operate on a completely different level and that you know their mind altering substances that's the basic that's what they do and it you know it's an altered state of consciousness that you would never normally have and during these kind of periods of altered consciousness a lot of people do feel this connection to something. They do feel a dissolution of their ego and their self and like their own self-importance. And that's really where the research is kind of looking at at the moment. And that's where I'm really interested in. So as I say, back in the, uh, you know, the sixties and the seventies, these, especially LSD and magic mushrooms, they, they kind of became it was a big issue for the American government actually, because a lot of the American public kind of turning against the government because they were being forced to go to Vietnam. They were fighting a war that didn't make any sense. None of them wanted to do it. And then they had this kind of alternate lifestyle that they could have where they were expanding their consciousness. And that made them even more certain that, you know, the Vietnam war wasn't right. And there was no point to that. And, you know, the government didn't like that. So, you know essentially they kind of said well we need to do something about this and they criminalized it so they made it illegal to have these psychedelic substances and from the research i've done there's been a lot of kind of spin doctoring and a lot of propaganda about kind of lsd and the dangers of lsd and magic mushrooms and they basically become demonized over the years um to the point where even i like growing up i wouldn't if someone offered me anything like that, I wouldn't want to go near it because I'd be terrified of what might happen. Because, you know, especially the, like the media, the press, the government, they're really pushing to kind of get rid of these, um, you know, psychedelics. And that meant that a lot of research that was ongoing at the time just completely got scrapped. And it was really promising. It was looking really good for treatments for depression, for anxiety, for addiction. Um, and then because it became illegal and criminalized and demonized, all that research got scrapped. And then no, no one ever really kind of went near it again until quite recently, I think, you know, towards the end of the 90s, I think. Um, people started looking at it as an option, um, you know, to look at the sort of research and see, you know, what, you know, therapeutic, you know, what therapeutic benefits it could have. And over the last kind of 10 years, I think it's been, somebody, people have been really pushing it. And like I say, now it's, you know, it's been decriminalized for research purposes, which is a huge step forward in the study of psychedelics. Um, it's also, you know, there's a lot of research going on at the moment um, in London and America. And so far, the results are looking really, really promising. So I'm really looking at kind of, I'm really interested in psilocybin. So from what I've researched and what I've read, um, you know, they've discovered that a single dose of psilocybin has proved effective in... I mean, not only putting depression into remission, but 
as far as they can kind of tell so far, because the research can only go so far, it's only just recently started, that there haven't been any reoccurrences in some patients of depression. And these are people who have suffered with like resist uh, treatment resistant depression for most of their lives. So to have that kind of effect, it's, I mean, it's staggering, I think. You know, we're talking about a single dose of psilocybin, a single dose, that's one tr like dose of psilocybin. I take, um, what do I take? I take two antidepressants every day. I take one anti-anxiety medication every day. Overall, between them, three of them, I'm taking one, two, three, five pills a day. That's five pills a day, every day. And that's looking like it's going to be every day for the rest of my life. This research is showing that one dose of psilocybin could have a dramatic effect on my depression or anyone's depression, on depression in general. And I mean, how could someone like me who does have depression and really bad anxiety, treatment resistant depression, I mean, people like me and people who suffer with mental illness, the one thing we all have in common is we want it to go away. <laughs> I mean, it sounds, yeah, it sounds simple, but that's ultimately that's what we want. We want it to not be around anymore. We want the magic pill that never existed and never has existed and probably never will exist. And from what I've read and the research I've looked at, the psilocybin treatment is the closest that I think we're ever going to get to the magic bolt, uh, the magic pill that's going to stop depression or dramatically reduce it. And I think, how could we not look into that? How could we not be kind of making more of that situation? Because, you know, the mental illness is, it's not just a phase that we're going through society. It's not just kind of like a, it's not a small percentage of people that go through this. This is like widespread, it's epidemic levels. You know, we're all kind of struggling with things in our lives, you know, some more than others, but mental illness is, it's rife, you know. And the thing is, if something like this could help millions and millions and millions of people, why aren't we making more effort to, to, to sort it out? Why aren't we, from what I've seen, the government is making it difficult this to go through there's no pharmaceutical company that's interested in developing this as a treatment and from a business point of view that makes sense because if they spend millions or billions developing psilocybin as a treatment for depression and you're cured after one dose they're not going to make any money out of that there's no repeat business why would they invest money to develop that i don't you know i can understand that from a purely financial point of view but from like a social economic, like from a social point of view, how could how can we not be making more effort to research these things and refine them and develop them to the point where, you know, we can use it medicinally. A GP can ref like you know, give you a prescribed prescribe you psilocybin. You know, I don't I don't get it. You know. So yeah, that's where I'm at, at the moment. I'm I'm currently kind of talking to Imperial College because they're running trials at the moment to to test the effects of psilocybin on treatment resistant depression. Um, I think they're doing a trial quite soon, which I wasn't eligible for for various reasons. But there's one going on later on in the year, so I'm thinking October, November time and I'm on the list for that essentially so and you know I want to do it you know I want to do it even if it you know I'm at the point now where I'm thinking even if it doesn't work for me if me participating in this research helps them refine it develop it make it better you know why wouldn't I do that why wouldn't I put myself I mean it's not even any risk that's the other thing I wanted to talk about it's kind of like people are scared of when you start talking about psychedelics or taking illegal drugs, there's this inbred fear into us that we're just like, oh no, we can't talk about that. We can't go near that. That's, that's bad. That's dangerous. Whereas if you look at the research, you know, psilocybin, I'm talking about psilocybin a lot because that's where I'm focusing my kind of attention on, but I have looked into kind of things like LSD and ayahuasca and DMT. Psilocybin, for a start, it's completely natural, it's organic, it's, there's no chemicals added, 
there's no kind of you know manufacturing process there's no pharmaceuticals involved it's derived from a natural substance so in that respect already it's going to be better for you because there's no chemicals or you know additives or anything like that secondly in terms of you know it's non-habit forming again so from all the research I've read, you know, people only need to do it once or twice in their life. Once or twice in their life, it's a kind of drug where you don't go back to it. You don't become addicted to it. So, you know, again, it's harmless in that respect. Then when you compare it, I think somebody generated a list about the most harmful, when, when you list them down from like one to 10, the most harmful drugs that we currently use at the moment and psilocybin was way down it's like you know and guess what was at the top so psilocybin's maybe let's say psilocybin's at 10 at the very top of that list was alcohol and alcohol you know think about it alcohol is it's legal it's relatively inexpensive and affordable it's socially acceptable and you know it boggles my mind because I can guarantee I can guarantee that more people's lives have been destroyed by abusing alcohol than have ever like, had any problems if you compare that to someone who's taken psilocybin or magic mushrooms like there's no comparison there like I I know from personal experience the effect that alcohol can have on lives and families and it's damaging it's one of the most damaging drugs that we can have and yet we partake in it regularly, you know, and I, like I say, it's socially acceptable. Whereas if I was to say to somebody, oh, I'm going to go home and do some magic mushrooms, I'd be ostracized or I'd be judged or, you know, there's a huge stigma attached to kind of taking, and to be fair, yeah, okay, it's an illegal substance at the moment, but you've got to look at the reasons why it's been made illegal, you know, from a purely health and you know harm point of view it's very very low in terms of like it's not going to hurt you it's not going to be you know turn you into an addict it's you know it just it drives me crazy really it does to, to think about how demonized it is yeah so at the moment, I'm kind of just sitting back and trying to hold on and, you know, hope that the trial works out. And even if I don't get on this trial, that eventually one day people are going to realise the benefits of these kind of psychedelic medicines because they're medicines. And, you know, in the end of the day, any kind of drug or, you know, yeah, any kind of drug can be dangerous if it's misused. And that's the most important part of the whole thing. Um, there was a very good concept that came around in the original kind of back in the old days when they first started doing these things, the research into like psilocybin. The, one of the most important parts of the process is the set and the setting. So when they talk about set and setting, they're talking about your mindset when you're doing it and the setting is where you do it and those are very very important things to do during the experience of taking psilocybin because in the end of the day it is a psychoactive substance you are going to have a psychedelic experience you are going to have a trip essentially you're going to you know see things you're going to experience things and i guess that can be very scary and that's why set and setting is so important. So you set your intention before you start what you want to get out of the experience, what you want to achieve. And for most people in my situation, it's just to kind of feel something, feel connected to the world in a way that I'm not at the moment, to just not feel this dread that something bad's always gonna happen. And the setting, again, it's like, you know, if you're in a nightclub and there's loud music and there's people pushing and shoving you around, that's not a good experience. That's not going to be a good setting for you to have a psychedelic experience. 
so with the research that they're doing, they set you up in like a nice quiet room with relaxing music and you get to lie down and you're comfortable and there's somebody there with you all the way through looking after you, making sure you don't feel scared or upset. And it's done very respectfully and kindly and, you know, it's all about looking after you, you know, and making sure you look after yourself. So, yeah, any drug can be misused and psychedelics have been misused. I mean, there's no denying that. They have been misused and abused. But I don't think that we should let that kind of taint the entire experience for everybody you know and as far as I'm concerned I think it is the future of um, psychiatric medicine because one of my therapists once told me that at the moment pharmaceutical industries aren't even interested in developing any more kind of treatments for depression or anxiety they're just happy to kind of use what's already there and I mean as I mentioned before in one of my videos as much as medication helps me most of the time it only helps me to function whereas i would rather kind of live you know that's what i want i want to be able to live and at the moment unfortunately psychedelic um, psychiatric medicine it's kind of getting you to a point where you can bear you know being alive and you can function in the world and i don't want to live like that i want to live i want to be able to feel and experience life and I honestly believe that psychedelic medicine is the way forward and for me psilocybin is I reckon you know I'm, I mean I'm going to predict the future here I'm going to say within the next 10 years psilocybin is going to be um, decriminalized I think it's going to be legal um, for medicinal purposes obviously um, and yeah I'm sure it's going to help a lot a lot of people like me and I hope it does um, and if I can do some research to help that happen, as I say, even if it doesn't ultimately help me, because there are certain, there's a certain percentage of people that it, it's not going to work for. That's the reality, unfortunately. Um, but even if I am one of those people, if that helps them in their research and to get it and refine it and make it better for the, for the future, I'm definitely going to do that and I'm definitely going to stand by it. Um, like I say, there's all sorts of like psychedelic medication, uh, psychedelic substances, and they're all kind of interesting in their own ways, like the kind of experience that they give you. But they all kind of have in common that they make you feel connected to something bigger than yourself, or yeah, the whole disillusion of the ego, and you know, that's vital. I think when you want to try and treat depression. So yeah, I read a really interesting book actually. I'm gonna put the link in the description below. It's called um, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. And I'm not sure what his background is. I think he's into kind of like herbal remedies and growing organic vegetables and things like that. But he wrote a really interesting book and it's all about his experience of looking into the history of psychedelics and the reasons why it was like they were made illegal and you know what kind of research has been done over the years and as the new psychedelic renaissance is kind of kicking in at the moment he decided to do more research himself so he went to all these places and he did a lot of psychedelic he had a lot of psychedelic experience so he sampled psilocybin I think he did LSD, um, ayahuasca, and a toad. There's like a toad that secretes some kind of psychedelic substance, and he did that as well. And he had no experience of ever doing psychedelics in his life. And it was just fascinating to read his experience, because he wrote it out as he was going through it. Or shortly after, I don't know if he wrote it while he was having a trip, that would have been a bit weird. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting book, just from like it gives you the entire history of psychedelics and you know it kind of gives you a good overview of, of why they were made illegal and it wasn't necessarily for the right reasons uh, and I think that's something really important that we should always keep in mind you know 
why is it wrong why is it bad why was it banned why is it illegal is it for the right reasons um so yeah it's it's a good book to read even if you're not interested in doing psychedelics um so i'll, I'll put a link in the description below um i think i'll leave it there for now but at the moment yeah i'm i'm just waiting for the call now essentially uh, there's also I'm a member of something called the Psychedelic Society, which is based in London, and they do a lot of kind of psychedelic experiences and, you know, gong baths and meditation and, um, but it, it, they go, they do as much as they can short of giving you magic mushrooms because that's still legal here and they can't do it. Although they do kind of have a partnership with somewhere in Holland, so they organize weekend retreats where you can go and I think you you have like some mush, magic mushroom truffle tea and that kind of gives you the experience and then they're there with you this this group and they kind of they sit with you for the experience and then they spend a couple of days with you just kind of sorting it out with you in your mind and it you know, I was very, very tempted. I still am very, very tempted to do it because it's the only legal way that I could do it at the moment. And my depression has got to points where I'm just like, I don't know why I'm living with this when I have this option available to me. I can go to Amsterdam, I can go to Holland, I can go through this experience, I can do it right now, but part of me is always kind of held back. Um, and I think it's because I was waiting for something like this medical trial to come along. So that's all done with like a lot of support from psychiatric staff and nurses and uh, therapists. They're with you every step of the way. Um, so yeah, I'm really kind of holding out for that trial now. Uh, but like I say, mark my words, I reckon within 10 years, the psilocybin at least is going to be legalized and it will be used to treat depression. I'm not sure how that's going to work in practical terms, like who's going to develop it, who's going to manufacture it, because pharmaceutical industries aren't interested. All the research that's being done at the moment is all self-funded or privately funded. So, but anyway, I'm going to leave it there for now. It's just, it's a subject I'm really passionate about at the moment. And yeah, I'm just...